So today we'll be continuing on the theme of single cell data analysis and specifically talking about uh, dimensionality reduction. And we also have a guest lecture by Josh Welsh. So uh, we'll talk about some supervised and unsupervised ways and then some linear uh, reduction of dimensionality and some nonlinear uh, reduction of dimensionality and then uh, sort of make the relationship with uh, deep learning uh, embeddings. So as we talked about at the beginning of this section, uh, there's gene expression matrices that measure uh, thousands of genes across you know, thousands of experiments. So with single cell data, those matrices are basically you know, uh, maybe a thousand or more genes across 10,000 or more cells across many, many different conditions. So you can basically think of these matrices as either going down the dimension of genes and looking at the expression patterns of all genes in a given experiment, or the profile of gene expression of a given gene across many different cells or many different experiments. And we can use this for clustering of either genes together or cells together, or for classification of what are different cell types based on their gene expression, or what are different genes based on their cell type specific expression. So we basically distinguished previously the concept of clustering versus classification. So in classification, you're asking what are the genes that allow me to classify a particular cell as, I don't know, a neuron or an excitatory neuron of layer four versus an astrocyte based on their gene expression pattern or what are the de novo learned clusters of cell types and how can I uh, infer these cell types de novo, sometimes revealing clusters that we don't yet understand at first, but then we can go in and um, discover uh, later. So with supervised learning, you kind of know the classes and you're looking for differential expression. Whereas for unsupervised learning, you don't know the classes in advance. And one of the techniques that we're going to look at today is dimensionality reduction for revealing these classes. So with supervised learning, very often you're asking what are the genes that are differentially expressed between one cell type and another cell type or between neurons in a disease state versus neurons in a you know, non-disease state. And you can basically build hypotheses that describe uh, you know, null model where there is no difference in expression versus a correlated model where, for example, the covariance is non-zero on the off diagonals that two genes are in fact correlated with each other or that a gene plays a role in a particular condition. So you can basically evaluate the statistical significance of that differential expression using uh, this hypothesis testing framework, which is asking what is the load likelihood of one hypothesis versus another hypothesis explaining the data that we have observed. So this is the foundation of a lot of the differential expression methodologies that uh, we've studied. And of course, the question is, how do we model these read count distributions for microarray experiments is very different than from RNA-seq experiment at, at the bulk level and very different from single cell RNA-seq experiment. So you should always think about what is the underlying distribution of the data and what is the most appropriate fit for the observed distribution in your data set. And for example, one of the most popular methods for both bulk data sets and uh, single cell data sets by aggregating all of the data together from a, every cell type into a pseudo-bulk profile is the seq, which is actually using this negative binomial distribution, which is representing the uh, particular expression pattern of uh, all of the genes in a particular cell type or in particular bulk experiment as derived from a distribution that is actually a much closer fit to the data. And then you can ask for what is the average expression for a particular gene versus what is the change in expression for that gene in a particular uh, condition. 
And you can then ask, after I found a bunch of differentially expressed genes, are they enriched in a particular uh, category by carrying out a hypergeometric test that basically tells you how likely is it to select K genes from that category and N minus K outside that category, given that I've chosen N genes in my cluster. Okay, so you're, you can carry out that hypergeometric test by asking for something that's at least that many in a particular category. So we've seen various forms of that throughout um, uh, the course. And you can always, of course, correct for the number of hypotheses that you're testing using von Ferroni correction. That's basically asking, given the number of hypotheses that I've tested, what is the uh, number that I would expect to be above a certain significance? Or you can do other types of corrections that are specifically asking how many pass the particular threshold rather than how many did I test overall, which are less stringent. So this is uh, the Benjamini Hochberg uh, correction, which is basically saying, given the p-value that I have observed, what are the number of tests above a particular p-value? And that's a much less stringent uh, threshold. So that's all for supervised learning. But for unsupervised learning, that's again where a lot of the dimensionality reduction comes in, even though it's applicable to both. So there's many different reasons for dimensionality reduction. One of them is overall data visualization to be able to represent the data sets in a way that is intuitive for us humans and researchers that can then build intuitions about the data to then carry out statistical tests about those data sets. A second one is data reduction. So I've spoken with many of the teams who are basically telling me the data is just simply too enormous. Uh, what do I do? And one way is to actually reduce the dimensionality of the data before you apply your supervised learning or unsupervised learning approaches. Data classification, looking for trends, looking for the principal components of variation, namely what are the factors that are driving the variability of the data sets that can allow you to, for example, distinguish the effect of a disease on your uh, global gene expression patterns versus the effect of male, female, versus the effect of age, versus you know, the batches and so on and so forth. So understanding factors that drive your variation is a major use of dimensionality reduction, as well as simply reducing the noise in your data set, being able to look for a lower dimensional representation of the data understanding that the noise is very often a uh, very high frequency variation that is not captured in those lower dimensions. Um, there's a caveat, of course, where some of the batch uh, effects are in fact global and are pa part of the factors. So it's a, you know, a trade-off, but a lot of the noise in the measurement that is not driven by global parameters will be effectively reduced or sometimes eliminated using these dimensionality reduction approaches. So then the examples of these is how many unique subsets uh, of data sets are there in the data. So when you do your clustering, you can say, okay, well, there appears to be 20 cell types or you know, 15 of them we can, we can understand. The other five are novel. Let's find out more about them. Uh, how are the cells similar or different from each other? What are the underlying drivers of variation in my samples? Are there any particular trends that are temporal or you know, correlated with particular cofactors and covariates? Um, what measurements are needed to differentiate between two different classes? So that's part of feature selection, but in an active learning kind of way where you can basically say, if I look for the um, best way to distinguish cancer you know, res uh, immunotherapy responders from non-responders, and what measurements should I make early on to differentiate those? And again, very interesting, very commonly we will ask what is interesting about the data and what subsets does a new sample uh, belong in? So that's what dimensionality reduction is saying. It's basically asking, can I project my very high dimensional data into a lower dimensional manifold that has a smooth uh, variation along this lower dimensional space. So in this particular case, the actual data is embedded in three dimensions, but then you can 
actually find a lower dimensional plane, which is shaped through this three dimensional space where the data truly resides. So if I want to ask, where is this circle relative to that circle? I'd rather only move on the X, Y coordinates of that plane where the data truly resides rather than have the full three dimensional space, which will then lead to non feasible parts of the space. So what a manifold is, it's a topological space that locally resembles a Euclidean space near each point. And an embedding in a manifold is a structure preserving mapping of a higher dimensional space into a lower dimensional space. And manifold learning is about learning a lower dimensional representation that allows this uh, embedding. So the, the, the concept here is that we're gonna take very high dimensional data and understand the true dimensionality of the data. And why do we talk about true dimensionality? Because not every gene varies in isolation of all the other genes. Basically, if you pull the gene expression pattern of a cell towards, I don't know, responding to stress, then genes do not respond in isolation. They respond in pathways and they respond in groups that are biologically meaningful. And this is not true of just biological data. It's true of all real world data where basically there's a underlying true dimensionality of the data that is driving these associations. Okay, so let's do a very quick poll of uh, who is following so far on this manifold uh, learning representation. Great. So there are, uh, so 67, 19, 10, 5, 0. Um, so there are many ways of learning these manifolds. So the first way we're going to talk about is a linear way. And then we're going to talk about nonlinear dimensionality reduction. So one of the most common linear dimensionality reductions is principal component analysis. And what principal component analysis is basically asking, is there a lower dimensional linear projection of the data that allows me to capture the major sources of variation in a deterministic and provably optimal way. So what the principal components are, are effectively the axis of greatest variability. So if you have a population that's measured on a bunch of random variables, these random variables represent the uh, coordinate system within, that, within which that true population resides. And we may be measuring the expression of, you know, um, let's say two different genes, but the true underlying dimensionality is that the two genes are you know, positively or negatively correlated with each other and they both co-vary. So it's that amount of co-variation, it's that lower dimensional embedding that we are um, interested in, not the overall you know, full space, which is simply not explored by the data set. So we can simply, for example, rotate the axis and recognize that the data primarily resides along this variation which might be driven by the amount of exposure to a pathogen. And then the other variation might simply be the, I don't know, inherent original state of the cell or something like that. So to basically learn these principal components, you can uh, basically project the data into um, a set of linear coordinates, which is a transformation of your original space. So basically given endpoints in an n-dimensional space, how do you project into one dimensional space and then minimize the sum of squares of distances to that line to find the optimal line that projects through that. And why the sum of squares? Because number one, it allows fast minimization, assuming that the line passes through zero and it is also symmetric. You don't have to worry about positives and negatives. So the traditional approach for this has been to uh, look at the uh, eigenvectors of that uh, original data. So what are eigenvectors? Eigenvectors are basically transformation, are, are the vectors such, as, such that a transformation of that vector through a matrix, rotation, shearing, scaling, etc., is in fact simply a linear product, a linear scaling of that original vector. So it's effectively the vectors that are invariant to those transformations. So then the question is, um, you know, what are, for example, the eigenvectors of 
a set of um, you know data set, then you can sort of very easily compute that by solving the equation of you know starting from that exact definition of the matrix transformation of that vector is effectively a linear scaling of that vector, which means that that matrix transformation minus the same scale times the identity matrix is in fact zero. And that is solved by that, which is simply zero at M distinct solutions, depending on the true order of that equation. Okay, so for symmetric matrices, eigenvectors are orthogonal, as you saw, you saw in the previous example. Uh, and then the eigenvectors of a real symmetric matrix are real. And the eigenvectors of a positive symmetric matrix, which is defined by this, are all non-negative. So this is the very basis of eigen decomposition, where you're basically taking a large matrix of uh, data, which is asking you know, exactly the same way that I showed you in the very first slide, what is the expression level uh, in columns for every gene in rows, in every condition in columns. And that expression matrix, you can now start decomposing into the principal vectors of variation times the scalars times the inverse of that matrix. So basically, if your original data is a square matrix with m linearly independent eigenvectors, namely a non-defective matrix, then there exists an eigen decomposition, which is unique, which is uh, unique if the eigenvalues themselves are distinct. And if the eigenvalues are distinct, then it's just simply flipping between eigenvectors of the same eigenvalue. Namely, this is sorting all eigenvalues by their magnitude, and then looking at the corresponding eigenvectors where the first eigenvector captures the most variation in the highest eigenvalue, the second eigenvector the second most by the corresponding eigenvalue, and so on and so forth. So this diagonal uh, matrix basically represents the effects of these independent principal components uh, of your uh, corresponding data set. So, and then these, uh, the columns are the eigenvectors and the uh, corresponding uh, scalars are the eigenvalues. And this is basically capturing the most natural linear dimensionality reduction of your data set, where you have now basically taken the principal dimensions of variation, and you can now start trimming down the principal uh, components here, the, the, the eigenvalues, and simply say, well, if we look at that data set in the first two dimensions only, you now have an optimal two-dimensional linear projection of your original data set, which best captures the original variation. If you want a three-dimensional object, you just look at the, the first three dimensions, four-dimensional, and so on and so forth. Okay, so who's with me so far on uh, eigenvalue decomposition of uh, my matrix? Lovely. Okay, so we're at 70, 14, 14, 5, 0. So this is all nice and good, but that's for symmetric, uh, that's for uh, square matrices. For general n by n matrices, then we have to resort to singular value decomposition. So for symmetric matrices, you basically have a set of u and u inverse that are the same dimensionality, but for non-symmetric matrices, for non-square for non matrices, you basically need a different type of factorization. And that's what singular value decomposition does. So what singular value decomposition uh, does is that it basically says, what are the uh, eigenvectors of my genes? What are the eigenvectors of my conditions? And what are the combinations of them that best explain the data? So instead of taking the decomposition in one dimensionality only, which is you know, through this symmetric, through this uh, square matrix, you instead ask about one dimension versus another dimension. So 
what you basically do is you represent your original matrix A as an M by M matrix, an N by N matrix, and an M by N matrix. So the columns of this U matrix are the orthogonal eigenvectors of AA transpose. Why AA transpose? Because that becomes immediately a square matrix. For V, it's the orthogonal eigenvectors of A transpose A. Again, it's a square matrix. So M by M, N by N. And then the eigenvalues of A, A transpose are the eigenvalues of A transpose A, which are effectively the square root of the singular values uh, of um, the corresponding matrix. So what you end up with is a three-way decomposition, which again gives you the singular values here corresponding to the eigenvalues previously, and then the singular vectors in uh, both other matrices. And the way to think about this is that you are effectively uh, taking a complex matrix operation, which is you know shearing the space into and decomposing it into a, just a rotation because this is a square matrix, another rotation for the other square matrix, and then a scaling for the uh, you know eigenvectors. Uh, the, the singular vectors. So the original matrix is basically a series of operations of V uh, star applied to X and then S applied to that and then U applied to that. So the advantage of singular value decomposition is that it applies to non-square matrices and it allows you to uh, represent in your singular values the order of the most important dimensions, linear dimensions of variation onto which you can project the data in an optimal way, given, uh, again, a linear uh, projection. So uh, the, the most important theorem here is that singular value decomposition can be used to compute an optimal low rank approximation of your original data. So if you wanna find a lower dimensional representation of dimensionality K of your original n-dimensional data set, then you can basically say, in order to minimize the distance between my original matrix uh, and, and the revised sort of lower dimensional matrix, according to this Frobenius norm, which is basically this Euclidean norm of you know, the square of the um, values here, such that they're both n by n matrices, then the optimal solution is actually given by the singular value decomposition. This is the optimal sort of linear dimensionality reduction. So, and the way to do that is you keep the first K eigenvectors and the first K eigenvalues completely unchanged. And then you simply zero out the remaining eigenvalues, effectively zeroing out the effects of the remaining eigenvectors. And this is, uh, you know, the optimal solution for such a dimensional error deduction. So who's with me here on the linear dimensionality reduction by taking the singular value decomposition and then zeroing out the K plus one all the way to the remaining eigenvalues and effectively zeroing out the effects of the remaining uh, eigenvectors. Okay, so that's basically what uh, principal component analysis does. So basically these principal components are looking for the corresponding eigenvectors of the top eigenvalues uh, of my matrix decomposition. And in the MNIST data set that you saw for your first problem set, this is basically taking these pixel values and effectively projecting them in a way that um, preserves the distances between these representations. So if you have, for example, all of the images in pixel values of character zero, they're in fact very close to uh, character eight, and they're very close to character six, and they're actually very far from character one, which is actually close to character seven, and so on and so forth. So principal component analysis basically captures the major linear dimensions of variation. But again, this is the best you can do with a linear projection. Uh, 
What nonlinear dimensional interior reduction allows you to do is effectively uh, eliminate some of the constraints of linear embeddings. And in particular, this uh, T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding is a method of clustering data that preserves distances at varying scales. Instead of basically saying that all distances matter the same, which is what PCA is trying to do, it's saying, well, maybe some real proximal uh, numbers should be clustered closer together. For example, all of the zeros are very, very close to each other. And then you have to go a certain distance before you go to the sixes and the eights and so on and so forth. So maybe I would like an, uh, a mapping that preserves the proximity of all of the zeros in those near distances and the proximity of all of the ones in the near distances, but doesn't care so much about the intermediate and the long distance uh, relations. And that's what uh, TSNI uh, allows you to do. Basically allows you to take a very high dimensional space. So for example, 20,000 dimensions for the expression of every gene and then map it onto a lower dimensional space where the pairwise distances between say the most proximal points here are still the most proximal here without worrying about the longer distances. So what, uh, what this embedding allows you to do is define a radius within which you care about distances and distance preservation. You set a particular bandwidth such that this conditional that we're going to be measuring will have a fixed effective number of neighbors. And you could say, I want to be the closest to the 50 cells that I am the closest to. And beyond those 50 closest cells, I don't worry so much about the distances. So we're going to be looking for a projection of the original very high dimensional space into a lower dimensional space that preserves these pairwise distances within the new lower dimensional space compared to uh, the original space. So you want to choose an embedding that minimizes the divergence between the lower dimensional space and the high dimensional space. And the, 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 the concept here is that I don't care about where the data points go. I just care that similar data points are close to each other. I don't care where individual cells in that very high dimensional space go or projected to. I just care that cells that have similar expression patterns in this 20 dimensional vector are proximal to each other. So we're going to have an original distance uh, metric in the high dimensional space, which is basically telling me how different are these points i from points j in their x coordinate space, the 20 dimensional original space compared to all of the other points that are not the same. So basically the distance between I and J versus the distance of all of the other points, basically how similar are all of the you know, other points to the particular point that I care about. And uh, for all pairs of points, you know, K, uh, L. And how similar are these data points in the lower dimensional space? where this is going to be you know, more or less the same formula. So, and then the key idea here is that the low dimensional embedding will be using a student T distribution, and that's the name of T distributed uh, stochastic neighbor embedding to avoid overcrowding. So you're basically pushing the, uh, the dimensions out. So basically the, the Gaussian would be the blue distribution, which is uh, squishing things very close to each other. But then what the T distribution allows you to do is spread things out a little bit more by having the wider tails. So the mapping is actually nonlinear. You just have to search through a space of all possible mappings in order to find it. You can basically use gradient methods to find such an embedding and look for a method that minimizes a cost function that minimizes the KL divergence between your original space and your new space. So the new lower dimensional distance is PIJ, and then the original high dimensional distance is QIJ. And what you're looking for is that large uh, 
distances are modeled by uh, you know, small QIJs. And that small PIJs is modeled by, um, uh, if, if, small, if large PIJs are modeled by small QIJs, then you have a very large penalty. And therefore it's not okay to bring distant points to get uh, close to each other. But it is okay to separate nearby points. So when I was saying the closest points are clustered together, but then intermediate distances can actually be you know, pushed away. So what this T -stochast T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding does is that it preserves the local similarity structure of the data. And you're searching through that gradient. You're basically trying to optimize your uh, coordinates of this lower dimensional space, Y, by taking the gradient of this cost function relative to how you're projecting the data. So you're basically searching over the space of possible projections by looking at this cost function. And that derivative is basically, you know, the distance between those distances and then of the original points uh, uh, here, okay? So mm -hmm. what that allows you to do is effectively search for such uh, sort of lower dimensional embedding where these uh, local similarities will actually be preserved. So when you apply the same approach to the same original pixel wise data of the MNIST, uh, you know, handwritten digits data set, what you see is that the zeros end up forming a very, very tight cluster. And even though some of them were in fact very similar to sixes, this has actually been pushed aside and the eights are pushed aside. So the fact that six and eight and zero were all in the same part of the space originally is something that we've now lost, but we don't care about these global distances. What we care about instead is the local similarities of those distances. So we've basically optimized this projection space, which is a non-linear uh, embedding, in a, a non-linear two-dimensional embedding of this very high 20-dimensional uh, vector or you know, 96 by 96 pixel vector by preserving these local distances instead of these global distances and penalizing things when they are uh, spread apart, even though they were close to each other, but not penalizing things that are uh, sort of at intermediate distances. So let's see who's with me here on um, the, on, on TSNI, on basically this T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding that is basically taking a very high dimensional space projecting it into a lower dimensional space, optimizing that lower dimensional space such that, the, such that the KL divergence between the original distance function and the new distance function is preserved, but specifically for preserving these local distances to uh, each other. Okay, we're at 54, 38, 8, 0, 0. So this is the workhorse of a lot of the, uh, the visualizations surrounding single cell data sets. So basically, as you start thinking about your single cell data for many of your projects, you will be using TSNI or UMAP or other stochastic embeddings uh, into a lower dimensional space. So there's a lot of parameters that matter in these uh, embeddings. So basically, if you look at the distance of how many neighbors do I consider, if you only consider two neighbors, then you see that you don't capture the original structure of the data at all. If you consider too many neighbors, for example, a hundred neighbors, then you know the blue point is close to a hundred points. Well, all of them are the same. So you don't you don't have any information either with too many neighbors considered or with too few neighbors considered. But if you consider five neighbors or 30 neighbors or 50 neighbors, then you capture those uh, local structures. If you also take very few steps, you might not be able to find that optimal structure. And you will see that as the algorithm searches through that space Y, where these distances are preserved, it will sometimes you know, collapse things into exactly the same point and then sort of spread them uh, again. So you can play with the number of steps of this uh, projection as you're taking the gradient relative to the dimensionality of your data. 
uh, if you look at the sizes of the original cluster, so basically if the original data has very spread out clusters or very tight clusters, this is really uh, not something that matters for TSNI. It basically simply says, well, you know, the closest 50 neighbors are the same, regardless of how spread out or condensed they were in the original space. So that's something that the method is invariant to. As for the between cluster distances, as I showed you earlier, with 0, 6, and 8, it really doesn't matter. If your original data has blue close to yellow close to green, then the revised space projection, projections are, in fact, uh, again, invariant to that. It could, it could go any way. And again, that's because we're choosing a set of neighbors, a, set, a radius of search that we're, uh, that we're comparing to. And then sometimes there might be false clusters appearing if you're looking at sort of two uh, neighbors at a time and so on and so forth. But then with the right perplexity level, it uh, allows you to be invariant to that. And again, uh, the, these relationships, you know, will be very well captured if you look at five points or 30 points, but sometimes they will be lost if you're not looking at the right uh, distance. And again, uh, you know, I really encourage you to uh, play with this. You can uh, basically uh, try different perplexities, try different steps, and then see how your data changes along these different dimensions uh, by, by going here. All right, so Joshua, are you here? Uh, let's see. We are expecting a guest lecturer to arrive. Uh, Josh, are you there? Um, I don't think he's here yet. Okay, uh, let me, uh, all right, stretch break. Can we uh, sort of have people stretching while I'm trying to locate our guest lecture? This one's- Actually, hold on one second, I'm so sorry. I, you know, we will actually continue the lecture. Um, I'm sorry. So I hope people stretched in their uh, heads at least. And um, so Josh will be joining us very shortly. All right, so um, last time we talked a lot about, so I wanna give a quick introduction to his, method, to, to his lecture. So last time we talked about the um, challenges of uh, single cell data analysis. So right now, what we focused on is this concept of a lower dimensional projection of the data, either linear or non-linear, that allows us to actually learn the specific clusters of uh, cell types. So this is very often the first step. Uh, hey, Josh, uh, ready you when you are. And then you can carry out gene level analysis or trajectory level analysis or, you know, dynamics or learn about states and conditions. And what we're going to hear about today from Josh is how do we take not just one type of data set, but how do we take single cell RNA data and single cell attack data and many different types of omics data and project them jointly into a lower dimensional data set within which we can then match them to uh, each other. So uh, Josh, I see that you're there. Uh, do you mind sharing your screen and um, starting your uh, guest lecture? Awesome. Thanks, Manolis. <clears throat> So I'm going to put the, the chat, a link to the slides. All right, take it away, Josh. Thanks. All right, are the slides coming through? Yep. Great. And, and we good can afternoon, point everybody. Everybody. Great, thanks. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks, Manolis, for the invitation. So um, I'm excited to talk to you today, and <clears throat> if I had to summarize what I'm going to tell you in just a single idea, the key idea is that we are going to try to learn representations of cellular identity by integrating single cell multi-omic data set. And I'll show you several ways that we do that um, with some approaches that I've developed. So I'll, I'll give you a little background and motivation. I'll keep it brief because I know you guys have already heard about some single cell um, technologies and approaches. And then I'll um, introduce the LIGER approach and integrative non-negative matrix factorization. And I'll tell you about a way of scaling up the INMF algorithm using online learning. 
and then I'll tell you about a couple of um, very recent projects that are ongoing um, to integrate data sets with partially overlapping features and to combine variational autoencoders and generative adversarial networks to generate sickle cell RNA profiles. So um, as you've been, uh, been hearing in the past couple of lectures, there are a number of types of measurements that you can perform in single cells. And you can perform them from dissociated cells, which is the most common way of doing single cell measurement. Or you can do them in situ with spatial measurement, um, with spatial coordinates. Um, and so from dissociated cells, you can measure gene expression using single cell RNA-seq. You can measure um, histone modification or transcription factor binding using ChIP-seq or cut and tag or cut and run. You can measure chromatin accessibility or DNA methylation or chromatin conformation. Um, and the, the um, modalities that I uh, colored in red here are the ones that I'll be focusing on. <clears throat> and then um, in addition to getting information from cells in isolation, it's really useful to know spatial coordinates so that you can map the molecular information back into its tissue context. And there are a couple of protocols available for doing this. Um, most notably for transcriptomic measurement, but increasingly people are also working to measure other things um, with spatial resolution. And so um, traditionally, cell types have been defined um, in what I would call a qualitative fashion based on properties like gross morphology or the presence or absence of a couple of cell surface markers or um, easily observed phenotypic properties. But the availability of all these single cell measurements provides an opportunity to move toward a quantitative definition of cellular identity, where molecular and other types of information um, with single cell resolution are used to um, redefine cell types in a quantitative fashion, in a non-biased fashion. And there are a lot of efforts going on um, to use single cell technologies in this way, such as the Human Cell Atlas and the Brain Initiative has some efforts on this, the HubMap Project and others. <clears throat> and so there are a number of analytical challenges that these um, questions and data types raise. And I picked the ones here, uh, the, the questions that relate most directly to um, the methods I'll be telling you about. So first, there are a large number of measurements across condition species issues. And um, if we're talking about cellular identity, it's really uh, not just a discrete phenomenon, but there are also continuous aspects of cellular variation. And there are technical confounders mixed with biological signals. And there are multiple types of data measuring different types of features, but generally only one type of measurement per cell. And so to address a, a number of these challenges, um, I developed a tool called LIGER, which is based on integrated non-negative matrix factorization. And the starting point um, for this type of analysis is uh, two or more single cell data sets that share a common set of G gene level features. And these could be um, single cell RNA-seq data sets across multiple individuals or across species. Or these could also be measurements of different modalities like gene expression and epigenome uh, measurements or even dissociated and spatial measurements. But um, they all have to share a common set of G gene level features. And um, in order to integrate um, these multiple data sets together, the approach that we've taken is to perform integrative non-negative matrix factorization, uh, which I'll talk more about in a second. But first, um, I want to motivate uh, a little bit why uh, some of the reasons why we move towards a non-negative matrix factorization approach. And one of the reasons is because NMF yields what is sometimes referred to as a parts-based decomposition. And um, <clears throat> this is a property that was noted in the original uh, NMF paper that was published in Nature in 1999. And the example that Lee and Sung showed was <clears throat> that if you perform NMF on a set of uh, face images, um, you can get a very similar reconstruction of the faces using NMF and the more commonly uh, classic approach of PCA. So the reconstructions look similar, but if you look at the bases that are used or that are learned by NMF and PCA, they have very different properties. So the PCA basis um, is 
it can be described as holistic, where each principal component can you can think of as an eigenface. Whereas the NMF uh, basis represents a decomposition into parts. So the individual components highlight different uh, parts of a face. And so um, th this comes partly from the non-negativity constraint that's enforced in NMF. And so um, if we apply NMF-based approaches to genomic data or, or um, data where the features are genes, then you can interpret the NMF factors as metagenes. Um, and a metagene is a group of co-expressed genes or co-regulated genes. And you can think of these as biological pathways or cell type specific genes, or um, they can also capture technical factors as I'll show in a minute. And so at a high level, what uh, an NMF approach applied to genomic data does is it first groups genes into metagenes and then summarizes the expression of each cell in, uh, in the case of single cell data using these metagenes. So you can think of each factor as being, um, as telling uh, the, the contribution of each gene to each metagene and then um, calculating cell factors that tell for, for each metagene the corresponding metagene expression level of each cell. So um, we use an NMF approach um, in, in the LIGER tool. And um, what's unique about the type of NMF that we perform is there's both a shared and a data set specific component to each metagene. And this, the shared component um, has identical uh, loadings across all data sets, but the data set specific component um, allows each data set to add um, unique weights um, onto the shared component. And so um, intuitively what this gives us is a set of factors <clears throat> that represent the same biological signal across data sets um, and also identify uh, how that signal varies. <clears throat> so going back to um, the, the, uh, the framework that I posed at the beginning of quantitative definition of cell identity, we can think of these metagenes as providing a quantitative definition of cell identity and how it varies across data sets and biological contexts. And then after performing this joint factorization, <clears throat> we can use the cell factor loadings, which uh, I, I'm showing as H here, to perform uh, quantile normalization and joint clustering to identify cells, cell types, and cell states that correspond across multiple data sets. And um, by virtue of the, the non-negativity constraint and inheriting this parts-based uh, na notion, nature of NMF, we're able to learn um, interpretable metagenes that can give us a lot of insight into uh, the biology across multiple single cell data sets. So just as a, a simple example, um, factor 28 from this particular single cell data set loads most strongly on this particular cell cluster here. Um, and, it, and this is a, a data set from brain, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. But um, the, the, the metagene here represents cell type specific genes that define this particular cell type. And if we, if we look at the data set specific metagenes that are uh, learned across um, multiple individuals, um, we can see that um, they show us ways in which this cell type specific signal varies across the domains. And in this case, it turns out that this has some significance related to um, the, the biology and background of each of these domains, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit. So by learning both the shared and the data set specific components of these factors of variation, we can gain a lot of insights into cellular identity and how it's similar and different across data sets. Another big advantage of the interpretability of these metagenes is that they can identify technical signals and allow us to deconvolve them from the biological signals in the data sets. So one, one common source of variation um, that's kind of a nuisance in single cell data sets is the overall expression of mitochondrial genes. And um, <clears throat> this, this source of technical variation arises when um, uh, cells sort of are subjected to different stresses during the sequencing process. And because mitochondria are kind of tough, they protect the mitochondrial RNA. And so um, in this particular data set, factor 11 um, shows very uh, high loading in, in all clusters, but um, 
particularly in um, some uh, some corners of, of the clusters here, so to speak. And if you look at the top loading genes on this factor, it turns out that they're all mitochondrial genes. And um, if we were to include this factor in downstream analysis, we might improperly conclude that these cells here represent um, a distinct cell type, when in reality their main defining feature is just that they have a high mitochondrial gene expression. So by removing this factor, we can deconvolve the effect of this technical um, source of variation. <clears throat> okay, so now I'll tell you briefly about how we actually solve this um, INMF optimization problem mathematically. So um, here's the objective function. <clears throat> and um, like, uh, like all NMF problems, it's non-convex in you know, all parameters jointly. But um, if you hold any one of the matrix blocks fixed, then the optimization problem is convex um, in that one holding the others, holding the others fixed. Um, and so the, the original implementation of INMF used multiplicative updating, which is kind of a heuristic method um, for calculating um, uh, um, updates to learn the parameters. But um, we derived a novel algorithm based on block coordinate descent which has some um, significant advantages and um, gives us a convergence guarantee that the approach is guaranteed to converge to a local minimum, which is the best you can hope for in a non-convex problem. Um, and in particular, uh, the block coordinate descent algorithm converges very rapidly in practice for NMF because of the particular um, structure of the optimization problem. And so uh, in, in brief, what we do to solve this problem is for each of the uh, matrix blocks of parameters, um, W, the shared metagenes, V, the data set specific metagenes, and H, the cell factors. For each of these blocks, um, we fix the others and then update um, the remaining block by solving a non-negative least squares problem. And we use a very efficient algorithm for solving this NNLS problem. And so, um, Overall, the whole strategy is, is pretty computationally efficient and can scale to thousands of genes and hundreds of thousands of cells. So after performing this factorization, <clears throat> we can uh, assign each cell to the factor on which it has the highest loading, which gives uh, a sort of joint cluster assignment because each factor has the same interpretation across data sets. And then there are a couple of steps that we perform uh, downstream in order to increase the overall robustness of the analysis. We build a k-nearest neighbor graph within each data set using the cell factors, and then set each cell's uh, maximum factor assignment to the mode of its neighbors. And this essentially smooths out any, uh, any errors in the maximum factor assignments because the odds of all of the cells in a neighborhood getting the wrong assignment are, are relatively small. And then um, we perform a final quantile normalization step on the cell factor loadings um, so that the cells across data sets are directly comparable using their cell factor loadings. <clears throat> and then after that, uh, that final step of um, quantile normalization, uh, you can use the factors for downstream analysis like clustering or uh, visualization. So now I'm going to show you several uh, brief examples of the kinds of analyses you can perform using this approach. And the first one is um, integrating single cell RNA-seq data across human donors. And this is a data set that we generated um, for our 2019 paper. And we sequenced the substantia nigra from seven, seven human donors. And uh, this is the part of the brain that produces dopamine and it has a lot of uh, disease relevance. And uh, I think this was actually the first sequencing of, of human substantia nigra tissue using single cell approaches. And so um, if we just do a standard single data set, single cell RNA-seq analysis, the cells cluster completely by human donor because there's so much differences in age and sex and, um, and background from these donors. But after uh, learning the cell factors jointly using INMF, we're able to cluster the cells so that they cluster by cell type rather than by donor. Um, and, and we can identify the main uh, cell types of the substantia nigra. And then as I, I mentioned a minute ago in my example, uh, 
we can look at the shared and data set specific metagenes to really get some insights about how the cells are similar and different across human donors. And one of the interesting things we found is that if we looked at the um, microglia and astrocytes, we could see some data set specific terms, uh, uh, genes that were related to um, response to brain injury in subject 5828 and um, protein misfolding in subject 5840. And when we went back and looked at the, the metadata for these donors, it turned out that 5828 died from head trauma and 5840 had a postmortem diagnosis of cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is a, pro, a, a disease that has a, a protein misfolding uh, component to it. And so um, this shows how these uh, metagene factors can, can give you insights about variation in cell state and cell identity across uh, these data sets. So another um, application uh, is to integrate spatial and dissociated single cell data sets. And uh, we used uh, a data set from uh, mouse brain from single cell RNA-seq and uh, from the same brain region uh, measured using StarMap, which is a spatial transcriptomics protocol. And uh, these two data types have really complementary properties the um, single cell RNA-seq data doesn't have spatial coordinates, but it measures all genes. Whereas conversely, the star map data measures only a selected subset of genes, um, but uh, you have the, the, the spatial location within the tissue for each of the observed transcripts. And so by putting these two data types together, we can um, uh, identify the spatial locations of cell types within a tissue um, and also impute spatial, spatially resolved gene expression for genes that aren't measured in uh, the spatial data set. And so um, when we did this using the set of genes that's shared between the two data sets, we were able to jointly cluster the cells to identify um, a common set of clusters between the two data types. And then um, by looking back at the original um, spatial positions for the cells measured with star map, we were able to visualize the locations of these cell types within the tissue. <clears throat> um, and reassuringly, if you look within each cluster, um, the expression of key marker genes is very consistent between the two technologies. And uh, knowing the spatial locations of the cell types um, is important because it can start to tell you something about tissue architecture. And in the context of the brain, this is particularly important for knowing how neural circuits, uh, neuro, how neurons work together in neural circuits. Um, so one example of uh, an interesting and, and somewhat surprising thing that we found here is that there were two subtypes of astrocytes that we identified. And when we looked at the spatial locations of these two clusters, one of them um, had this odd pattern where the cells in this cluster are located only on the outside of the cortex. And um, looking at some, some orthogonal uh, data types that have spatial resolution, we were able to confirm that um, this seems to be a, a real biology. And so um, these GFAP positive astrocytes have this particular spatial location uh, on the outside of the cortex. Whereas the astrocytes that are located within the cortex are mostly the MFGE8 uh, subtype. So um, another really uh, important application of this sort of single cell data integration is uh, integrating multi-omic data sets from single cells. And this is a, a particularly unique and challenging problem because the, the, the data sets that you start with here share neither instances nor features. So your, your starting data matrices have, um, so in the case of ATAC-seq and RNA-seq, P peaks as the features for the attack seq data and G genes for the RNA seq data. And the measurements are performed in different cells that, that don't directly correspond across the experiments. Um, so, <clears throat> in order to link these data sets, um, we first perform a step of pseudo expression calculation where we transform the epigenome data 
uh, into gene level features um, in such a way that each uh, gene's um, epigenetic state uh, is summarized into a quantity that's correlated with gene expression. And for attack seek data, um, we tried several strategies for this, and it turns out that the one that works best is to just simply count how many accessible reads land in promoters or on the gene body for each gene. For methylation data, you can do uh, a similar type of thing by calculating promoter methylation or gene body methylation. And so after this, we, uh, we have input matrices that share the same set of features, uh, G genes, um, and have different cells. And after doing this uh, pseudo expression calculation, we can perform integrative non-negative matrix factorization again um, and uh, integrate the data set to link, uh, link the transcriptomic and epigenomic profiles. And so we, we did this using, uh, again, data from the mouse cortex. Um, the example here is from uh, single cell RNA-seq and single cell DNA methylation sequencing. And uh, we were able to identify uh, a, a set of very clearly corresponding cell types between the two um, modalities. And um, the, the, the labels matched well, uh, our joint labels matched well with the published labels for both the gene expression and methylation data sets. And one thing that um, was really interesting is we were able to identify some cell types from the methylation data that had previously had ambiguous labels um, because there, there are a lot more known markers uh, for cell types that are gene expression or protein markers than there are methylation markers. And so by linking the methylation data with gene expression, we were able to much better annotate the cell types. Um, and we can also do this type of analysis with single cell RNA-seq and single cell attack-seq data. Uh, and here's an example of um, how we did this with human bone marrow data. <clears throat> um, and as I mentioned, in order to do this, uh, in order to, to link these data types, you need to count reads on gene bodies and promoters for the epigenetic data so that you have a, a pseudo expression quantity for each gene. And one thing that's uh, really uh, a big win from putting these types of data together is that um, you can start to link um, epigenome state and gene expression state for individual genes within the same cell. Um, and <clears throat> this allows you to start to, to nominate intergenic regulatory elements that may regulate the expression state of nearby genes. So as a, uh, an example, we found a couple of peaks in the attack seek data here that show um, very cell type specific accessibility patterns. And the accessibility of these peaks is strongly correlated with the expression of neighboring genes. So just by calculating simple correlation across the linked cells, um, linked using INMF, we were able to uh, predict these gene peak links um, and to start to nominate cell type specific regulatory elements. And so um, if you look at the accessibility of one of these intergenic regions, you can see that it's very cell type specific and highly correlated with um, the expression of uh, a neighboring gene. So that's a, a quick walkthrough of LIGER and integrative non-negative matrix factorization and some of the ways that you can apply it to, um, to define cellular identity across different contexts. And now I'm going to tell you about a couple of ways that we've extended this approach. <clears throat> and the first is by creating an online learning algorithm to solve the INMF problem, which allows us to scale up to larger and larger data sets. So the, the idea of online learning, if, if you're not familiar, is that you can um, <clears throat> incrementally update uh, a, a calculation as new data arrives in a streaming fashion. And so in the context of <clears throat> single cell data, there are several different scenarios where this is useful. The first scenario is where you have um, 
multiple large data sets. So let's say you, you're trying to analyze the data sets on a laptop and you have fixed memory. Um, the previous approach that we developed for solving the INMF optimization problem requires you to have the entire data set stored in memory and to use every data point on every iteration of the algorithm. Um, but with the online learning algorithm, we can divide the data up randomly into mini batches of a fixed size. And we only need to load and use a single mini batch at a time when we perform um, an, an iterative update of, of the weights that we're learning in the algorithm. And so in scenario one, if you have really large data sets um, that are nonetheless fully observed, in, in other words, they're not dynamically arriving, you can use this mini batch approach um, to avoid having to store the entire data set in memory. Um, and it also converges much more rapidly because um, you don't need every data point for every update of the algorithm. Another scenario in which this is really useful, we call scenario two, which is where you have large data sets that are arriving in a streaming fashion. And a, a real world example of where this might happen is if you have a, a large consortium working to generate a, an atlas of an entire organism or tissue. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example in a minute from the brain initiative of how this is happening in practice. And so in this scenario, um, previous approaches would require you to reanalyze all of the data sets from scratch every time a new data set is generated by the consortium. Whereas the online learning algorithm allows you to just simply incorporate the new data set as it arrives without revisiting any of the previous data sets. Um, and then scenario three is where you have a curated existing data set and you want to use the weights that you learned from previous data sets to project a new data set into the reference. Um, and so um, all of these three scenarios are, are useful in different cases. Um, and uh, another big advantage of our approach is that, as I mentioned, you don't have to store the data set in memory, but you also don't even necessarily have to download the data set at all onto your hard drive. And so we, we showed that um, multiple users can analyze a single copy of the of the same data set by streaming mini batches over the internet. <clears throat> um, so just a few words about uh, um, the computer science behind this approach. Um, we leveraged some um, existing theory from a, a journal of machine learning paper um, that developed an approach for online dictionary learning. And uh, NMF is a special case of this more general problem called dictionary learning. And um, the key insight from this paper was that um, you can derive a custom online learning algorithm for dictionary learning by optimizing a surrogate function that converges asymptotically to the same solution um, in terms of parameters as the original objective function. And um, there, there are some a really nice properties of this solution um, in terms of convergence. Um, and since it's tailored specifically to the dictionary learning problem, you can actually have some really strong convergence guarantees, which you can't get from just using um, conventional um, stochastic gradient descent. And so for, for the INMF um, optimization problem, we can write out um, a slightly modified version of this surrogate function that's tailored to our particular objective. And then um, calculate um, updates that allow us to optimize the surrogate function iteratively when new mini batches of data arrive. Um, and here's uh, an overview of the whole algorithm. Um, the basic idea is that you sample a random mini batch from the data and then you calculate the cell factor loadings given your your current best guess about um, the metagenes which is the dictionary in this case um, and then um, one trick that allows you to avoid having to store all the previous data points in memory is that the updates for the dictionary um, depend only on the inner product between the cell factor loadings from the previously seen data points and so by incrementally computing this matrix product, as you see each mini batch, you can avoid having to store the, 
um, expression levels and cell factor loadings for the previous data sets. And um, this, this works really well in practice and it has the memory advantages that I mentioned, but it also converges much more rapidly because the larger your data set becomes, uh, the more redundant each additional cell is. And so you don't need to see every cell and every update of the algorithm in order to converge rapidly. And so um, this is an example from a, a large data set from mouse brain showing that if you look at the objective function over time, um, it, it converges very rapidly in the online setting compared to the batch setting. Um, or if you run it for a given fixed amount of time, the objective function after that amount of time is much lower using the online algorithm than using the batch algorithm. And so we, we did a benchmark against um, some other widely used methods, including um, Harmony and Surat in our previously uh, published approach. And uh, we found that indeed the, the memory usage is a really large advantage. Um, and it's also very efficient in terms of time compared to the other approaches. And um, we were able to use this approach to process 1.3 million cells in 25 minutes using 500 megabytes of RAM um, on my student's laptop. Whereas if you wanted to do the same analysis using one of the other approaches, you would have to uh, use some, some pretty large, large memory compute nodes uh, and, and a significant amount of time in order to run the same analysis. So as an example of um, this iterative refinement capability that I mentioned, which I refer to as scenario two of online learning, um, we use data that was generated by the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, um, which, which we are uh, members of. And <clears throat> the consortium has generated a bunch of data sets from a single region of the mouse brain, the motor cortex, um, and four labs generated eight data sets using five protocols over two years. So it was a kind of a, an ongoing process where every couple of months, a lab would generate another data set and upload it um, to share with the consortium. And so um, everybody was, uh, everybody who was analyzing the data would have to rerun their analyses every time when the data sets arrive. So to show the advantage of this iterative refinement capability, we took the data sets in the chronological order in which they were generated um, and incorporated them one by one into the factorization using this online algorithm. And so what I'm showing here are UMAP plots of the cell factor loadings at each step in this iterative refinement as a new data set arrives. And you can see that as the number of cells increases, the number of clusters that you can distinguish increases, and each successive data set is well aligned with the previous data sets. And what's especially cool about this is that it works with both the RNA data sets and the methylation and attack data sets. So the first six data sets that were generated by the consortium were RNA data sets, and then um, an attack seek data set and a methylation data set were generated. And so these also we were able to incorporate um, incrementally um, and they, they aligned really well and we were able to, at the end, jointly cluster using all of the data sets and modalities. Um, and it, it turns out that um, if you rerun the analysis using either of the other two scenarios, so um, using all the data sets at once in scenario one, or projecting the later data sets without updating the metagenes using scenario three, you get very similar results, which is, uh, which is reassuring and nice. <clears throat> okay, um, so now I'm going to change gears a little bit um, and talk about uh, how you can extend the INMF algorithm for the case where um, your, your features partially overlap. And this is kind of uh, an, an unusual case uh, in uh, data integration in general, but uh, it makes for an interesting computational problem. So the problem is that for many cases where we want to integrate single cell data sets, uh, the matrices that we want to jointly factorize don't have either the same number of cells, rows, or the same number of features uh, in columns. And um, previously, people have addressed this by just uh, 
kind of forcing the features to align to coincide by the pseudo expression calculation that I mentioned. Um, but a, a more satisfying approach would be to somehow be able to leverage both the shared and unshared features across the data sets. And so to do this, um, we modified the INMF algorithm so that you can um, calculate a metagene matrix that corresponds to the unshared features uh, and to the shared features for each data set. And um, it, this block diagram here shows how uh, all the dimensions of the matrices work out. Um, and in the end, this allows you to leverage all of the features that are present in the data sets. Um, as a concrete example, if we're integrating RNA-seq and attack-seq data, the RNA-seq data has only gene-centric features. And the attack seek data has both intergenic peaks and peaks that overlap genes and promoters. And so uh, previously, we would have been only able to use the gene centric features from the attack seek data. But with this algorithm, we can leverage also the intergenic peaks. And another common example of this type of um, setup is uh, where we have targeted genes, where uh, a spatial transcriptomic protocol measures only a subset of genes whereas the RNA-seq data set measures all the genes. <clears throat> and um, it turns out that this extension makes quite a large difference uh, in some cases. Here's an example of integrating um, a spatial transcriptomic data set that measures only 30 genes with a single cell RNA-seq data set. And on the left is what we get with the previous algorithm. And on the right is what we get with the algorithm that incorporates the unshared features. And it makes quite a difference in terms of your ability to resolve um, clusters. Um, and then just briefly, because this is a class focused on deep learning, I wanted to um, introduce a, a recent preprint that my group just released. Um, and the motivation for this work was to build generative models that can um, generate realistic cell profiles from single cell expression data. And um, as you might have uh, learned when you talked about VAEs and GANs, these are very different approaches that have kind of complementary strengths and weaknesses. And uh, VAEs are really good at learning meaningful representations, but not as good at generating um, realistic examples. And conversely, GANs can generate very realistic samples, but the latent space is not semantically meaningful. And so if you if you take a particular dimension of a VAE latent space and interpolate along that dimension, uh, the generated images change in one uh, semantic factor of variation, for example, skin color, or brightness, or uh, presence of fattiness. And conversely, if you traverse a single dimension of the GAN latent space, there's no rhyme or reason to how the uh, generated images change. And so um, all of this uh, common wisdom is from image data. But um, it wasn't really clear whether the same properties hold for single cell data. And so we, we did a bunch of benchmarking and we found that in the same way, uh, VAEs uh, learn good representations that are semantically meaningful and GANs generate better samples um, when they're applied to single cell data. Um, so um, without going into the details here for the sake of time, we developed an approach that combines the strengths of VAEs and GANs. And uh, we um, struggled to think of a good acronym that ends in GAN, so we just called it Michigan for, for our institution. And <clears throat> the key idea of the Michigan is that you first train a VAE. In this case, we used the beta total correlation variational autoencoder, which um, has an extra term in the objective that encourages disentanglement. And then after training a VAE, <clears throat> um, you fix the weights of the encoder of the VAE, which allows you to get uh, a representation for each data point. And then you use that representation as a code to train a conditional GAN. And then essentially you replace the decoder of your VAE with the generator network of the GAN. And this, this simple strategy <clears throat> is really powerful because it gives you the disentanglement performance of your VAE and the generation performance of the GAN. Um, whereas previous approaches to couple these two together really destabilized the training. 
Um, so uh, if, if you're interested in learning more about it, you can see uh, the preprint on the bottom of the slides here. And I think there are um, a lot of exciting applications in these types of generative models um, for uh, manipulating and predicting the effects of changes in, in cell identity. So with that, I'll wrap up. And uh, here are the students that contributed the work um, that I mentioned here. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Josh. A thing that we always ask our uh, guest uh, speakers is whether you'd be interested in serving as a mentor for any students who are uh, interested in this space. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Feel free to reach out if you're interested. Very cool. Thank you again for a great, great lecture. So uh, let's see, uh, let's do a quick poll. Oh no, I'm no longer logged in. So I can't do polls anymore. But give me a thumbs up if you guys feel that you've learned something. Awesome. Good. Awesome. Thanks so much for the great lecture, Josh. Bye, everyone. See you on Thursday.